millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. I think particularly what really brought this to a lot of people's attention uh, are gas prices. And I think the reason why is that they're just so visible, right? You, If you're driving to work, you're probably going to pass like five or six gas stations easily on your on your route in. And so you just see this big number plastered on a big giant sign on the corner of a street everywhere you're going. So it's like right in your face. Oh, I see that numbers are higher. And for a long time, gas was one of the biggest contributing factors um, to the high inflation number. And so it's very visible. And then now also grocery stores, when you go to the grocery store, you're, you're seeing, I know I for sure I'm seeing a big jump in prices. And so I think it's a combination of we actually are really noticing it because the prices, price increases have become so significant, combined with the fact that people are just talking about it. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, inflation. You hear about inflation everywhere and you feel it every time you go to fill up your car with gas or you pop in the store to buy some food. Wait, okay, I bought a small bag of food with milk, eggs and cereal and dog treats and it cost how much? Don't even get me started on bacon. (laughs) That is just through the roof. Inflation is currently around 7.7%, which is the highest it's been since the early 1980s. And it looks like it's here to stay much longer than pumpkin spiced lattes. It's not all bad, though. Higher inflation typically means higher interest rates on your savings accounts, which will have your emergency fund singing hallelujah for a change. So I went to my fellow podcaster, Chris Browning, host of the award-winning short-form podcast, Popcorn Finance, to join us for a conversation all about inflation. This episode, it isn't filled with boring stats, I promise you. Instead, Chris shares thought-provoking details like the psychology behind inflation, a deep dive into potential pros for inflation, and the exact steps you need to take to set your money up in 2023 to help combat inflation. Grab a beverage, sit back, and let's start talking. We're talking about this super heavy topic, inflation, and hopefully we're going to do our best to to really break it down in this episode. But I know it's something, it's causing a lot of pain for for so many of us listening. It's currently around 7.7% as we're recording right now in, in November 2022. 
But historically, it's been pretty low since the 70s when inflation was at another peak, about 10 to 14 percent. So I really think the numbers are one thing. But what I want to talk to you about is really what does inflation mean for everyone listening? Like, why should we care? And what can we do about it in terms of our money and goals kind of going forward? So, Chris, let's just kind of start at the beginning, if we can. Like, can you break down for us, like, what exactly is inflation? Yeah, you know, inflation is one of those terms that we all hear constantly, especially right now while inflation is higher than it typically is. But it's almost like this really vague term. You're like, oh, I hate inflation, but we don't all know exactly what that means. <laughs> so uh, there's a few ways to measure it. And I think that's why it's confusing, because not only is it a very vague term, but there's multiple measurements of inflation. Uh, so like one that you see out there, uh, this is what the Federal Reserve uses. So whenever uh, the Federal Reserve meets, they meet a you know, handful of times throughout the year. And that's when we get those big news reports about interest rates going up. They use a measure of inflation called the personal consumption expenditure. And uh, this is this is like managed and created by another government organization out there. They're called the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And it's like this really broad, like business data driven number where they actually go out and they interview different businesses and they're asking them, you know, what are your costs? Like, what is it costing you? What are you seeing people um, buy from you? Where are your prices at? And they have this very complex system of putting all this data together and coming <laughs> up with a percentage that they use to say, okay, this is our measurement of inflation. Uh, on the other hand, there's another one that's more consumer focused and it's called uh, CPI. You might've heard it referred to. And this is what you see in like the news stories. So like uh, every, every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, another government entity, they come out with this number uh, called the consumer price index. And it's measuring what us as like individuals are paying for goods. So they literally go out and interview people. They'll just call people up and they'll say, Hey, what did you spend on socks this month? What did you spend on cheese? It's, it's, it gets super granular. And they go through and they take all that data and they compile it together and they use that to come up with, with this index. And what they're doing is they're looking back over periods of time. So when you hear an inflation number reported, they're looking at like a 12 month span of time. So they're saying, all right, this is how much these bas this basket of goods and services cost this month. How much did the same grouping of things cost 12 months ago? And that difference in price is that percentage you see. And so- yeah. It's got kind of constantly moving. Every month is changing because not only are prices changing, but they're also comparing it to a different month, 12 months ago. Uh, and so it can get like really granular. Like I love, I don't know why I, I just nerd out on this. I love to go to their website and I go and look at the report <laughs> and it shows you how detailed it is. Like it gets to the point where they're like calling out like the price of beef steaks and how much those have changed month over month and that feeds into the overall um, equation they put together. And it's this big weighted average where everything in there has a different kind of like impact on the inflation number. So for example, like housing, that makes up about a third of the overall inflation uh, percentage you're seeing, whereas food is about 14 percent. Gas is about four percent of that overall score. Um, so it can get really, really detailed. But that's basically uh, I, in a nutshell what inflation is and those numbers you see reported in the news, where they're coming from. I love that you nerd out on this and kind of go to the website and like look up look up beef steaks. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. Uh <laughs> I was thinking about kind of like how, how we break this down for everyone listening. And I saw this graphic and it talked about like the simplest way to, to get inflation. And it showed like a cup of coffee in, in the seventies, yes. it was like 25 cents for a cup of coffee. And in 2022, it's now the average, like a dollar and 85 cents. And you may not think that that is a huge difference between 25 cents and a dollar and 85 cents, but that is a lot of inflation, like causing that cup of coffee to get more and more expensive over time. And I was kind of thinking about how this year we're so hyper focused on inflation. Like you watch the news, mm. you you know, you go on CNN or you know any of your news outlets, and they're always talking about inflation. You know, it was it was just uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales and kind of how. Uh, you know, people went out and shopped regardless of inflation. But I, I'm wondering, like, do we do we really care about inflation when the inflation number is lower? Or the reason we're caring about it now is just because inflation is being talked about everywhere. Yeah, you know, I think it's a combination of it's being talked about constantly. I mean, constantly. If you think about 
2019. Nobody was talking about inflation. It, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, it got reported every month. So the data was out there, but no one cared because it was relatively low. Uh, because like they, the goal, like the government's goal, except like the Federal Reserve's goal, because the Federal Reserve, they're in charge of our, our monetary policy to make sure everything's running smoothly. And, and their big thing is inflation. They want to keep it in check, but their, their goal is 2%. Like that's like what they're aiming for. They want inflation to be around 2%, um, every single year or every month when they look back 12 months and, Right now, it's clearly much higher than 2%. And I think it's a, a combination of like inflation actually being higher. Like I think you can physically go out and see that prices are higher than they were before. Uh, I think particularly what really brought this to a lot of people's attention uh, are gas prices. And yes. I think the reason why is that they're just so visible, right? You, If you're driving to work, you're probably going to pass like five or six gas stations easily on your on your route in. And so you just see this big number plastered on a big giant sign on the corner of a street everywhere you're going. So it's like right in your face. Oh, I see that numbers are higher. And for a long time, gas was one of the biggest contributing factors um, to the high inflation number. And so it's very visible. And then now also grocery stores. When you go to the grocery store, you're, you're seeing, I know I for sure I'm seeing a big jump in prices. And so I think it's a combination of we actually are really noticing it because the prices, price increases have become so significant, combined with the fact that people are just talking about it. And one of the weird things about inflation is that, yes, it is a real thing, but also it's a psychological thing at the same time. And mm. the more people believe there will be inflation, the more likely it is that we will have higher inflation. It's kind of like a um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Not saying that companies right now aren't raising their prices ridiculously just because they can, <laughs> because they for sure are. But also it can be this kind of psychological thing that if we believe things are going to be more expensive, then we might go out and buy things now versus waiting because, hey, if we buy it now, maybe we'll catch it before the prices rise. And then by doing that, you're kind of feeding into inflation. You're making prices rise because you're creating all this demand for things like we saw during the pandemic where you know people were going out and buying, you know, uh, what were some of the big things that was like, uh, you know, bread making was huge. Uh, totally, yeah, right. Doing home remodeling. Uh, yeah, people take Peloton up, bikes. Peloton. I, you <laughs> see, when everybody wants something, they'll, you grab it, it starts to sell out. And then these companies can say, well, hey, look, we can barely keep this in stocks. So we'll raise our prices because the demand is so high. So it's kind of a mixture of prices really truly being raised and getting kind of out of control, plus us all really being like having inflation just thrown in our faces and it's just on our minds. And we're really thinking about it and we can cause higher inflation um, just by the belief that there will be inflation. I think that's a really interesting point to to bring out and talk about because I feel like for so many people, inflation feels like yet another thing around money that they have absolutely no control over. Yeah. And, you know, that this somehow in the background, inflation goes up, goes down. And, it, you know, how I feel it is, yeah, at the gas station, at the grocery store. And then, you know, that makes me really frustrated and really angry at, at the system around money. And then I create these negative emotions around money and then I don't want to deal with my own money. And so it's really interesting to like kind of think about it as like this onion where there are lots of these layers that we can peel back. And one of those layers is literally our 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 mindset around the idea of inflation obviously we can't control the prices of things but but maybe we can in some in some way yeah we, we do have some impact but then also uh, i cuz whenever i talk about this because the psychological part is a real thing but i think what we're seeing right now is that there are it's kind of hard to reconcile the fact that Prices are raising, but then companies are having record profits at the same time. Yes. And so you're kind of like, yes, we do have an impact on the overall economy and prices because, yeah, you know, our actions affect the price of the goods that we go and buy. But also at the same time, these companies, you know, they got stock, they got shareholders are trying to keep happy. They got to keep their profits up. And so one of the ways they, they can keep their profits up are by raising prices and just keeping more of the money. Um, so I, I don't want to... Uh, minimize the impact and how significant that part alone might be having on inflation. And what do you think? We talked about the 70s in terms of like a cup of coffee. And the 70s was also when inflation was most recently at the highest, higher than it's been, you know, this at this point in time. What do you think the differences are between like the 70s and kind of now? Are we are we just going down this whole cyclical track where we'll kind of end up maybe, you know, more around like a 10% inflation before it starts coming back again? 
You know, it's it's really hard to say. That was a, uh, I think what's going on now and what was going on in the 70s and 80s are both kind of unique from each other. So when you look back at like the 70s, I think it was like around uh, the middle of 1978 through like early 1982, inflation was high. It was like consistently above, well above 7%. And it actually reached a peak of around 14.8, like almost 15% uh, in 1980. And so we're still a long way away from that. Like our, our numbers, although they are high, we're still pretty far from that. And we're actually <laughs> starting to see inflation come down a little bit. It's not low, but, you know, it's around like you said, 7.7 compared to, you know, being like around 9% a few months ago. Um, so we, we're not quite there. Uh, that was all spurred by like the the energy crisis and the the revolution in Iran and all the conflict going on over there and oil prices. And that kind of spurred a lot of what was happening there where what we're seeing now it was kind of triggered by the pandemic, right? We had uh, just a world changing once in a generation event happen where everything just completely changed. We had, you know, everyone locked down. You had what companies thought was going to be a, a complete drop off in demand. You, you assume that when people have to stay at home and people aren't working because they can't and they're losing jobs and losing income, it, what is the world going to end? No one knew what was going to happen. <laughs> So there was this assumption that, well, obviously the world's going to end. So people aren't going to be buying things. So a lot of companies completely shifted what they were doing and they shut down factories. They they decreased production thinking that why would we make all of this stuff and have it just sit in our warehouse and just eat up our revenue or like our, our money or just sitting in inventory. But the opposite happened. People were at home, but, and a lot of people weren't working, but demand still was there and it actually increased and jumped. Um, and so we had all this demand still pulling in, trying to pull for these products that weren't being produced at the same volume as they were before. Uh, and then you combine that with, you know, it's happening worldwide. So everyone's experiencing similar things where demand is up, even though people thought there weren't going to, there wasn't going to be demand. You have people not going to work because it wasn't safe. So they didn't have the capacity to produce as much as they did before. You had um, all these issues with uh, like in the harbors. Like I live in Southern California. Uh, I used to live in Long Beach where there's a huge port there between Long Beach and uh, San Pedro. And I would drive out there and you would see just ships way out into the distance, just sitting there, <laughs> right. just waiting to come in. Full of and, stuff. Full of stuff. And there weren't, they, they couldn't get it off the ships fast enough. But also what happened is you had all these shipping containers just sitting here in our ports. And so those shipping containers have to go back so they can put more stuff on them to bring it back over to us. And so because of that, they also created like an imbalance where now there wasn't a way to get enough stuff here faster because we couldn't get it processed and shipped out to all the stores. So it's a, I think it's a different situation. So I don't know if we'll actually get to the same point where we were in the 70s and 80s, but it is its own really unique and weird situation that we're all trying to see how this will shake out. Let's hope we don't get there. <laughs> yeah. I remember stories of gas lines and all sorts of, of, of craziness that happened uh, during that time period. But I think what you're talking about at, at the core of inflation, there's always this contrast of supply versus demand. And, uh, you know, can we get the goods? Can we not get the goods? How many people want the goods? You know, you know, what was the demand? And so there's always kind of this conversation around supply and demand. If we think back to like 2020 and the like toilet paper debacle, oh, man. <laughs> you know, we were paying outrageous prices for toilet paper because it's an essential. We needed toilet paper, but the demand was so high that people could literally charge who had toilet paper, charge a ton of money. I mean, that is inflation in itself, just with, you know, a roll of toilet paper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you saw it with hand sanitizer and masks for a period of time. I'm sure people see it with concert tickets when there's not enough of something, but a lot of people want it. It 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 tends to make people say, well, here's an opportunity for me to make some more money. And they'll just raise prices because they said they say, basically, I know I can keep raising this and people are going to buy it. So I'll stop raising my prices when people stop buying it. And sometimes that takes a really long time. <laughs> right. The prices get really, really high. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel like we've been talking for a little bit now about kind of all of the cons to inflation. And and I feel like with money, there's always a pro and a con. Sometimes it's hard to find the pro, but it does, it does exist there. So we know as interest rates rise, you are going to earn more in things like your high yield savings accounts, you know, all sorts of stuff. There are definitely some pros. So, you know, we're used to hearing inflation as this like terrible thing, but I'm curious, Chris, like how do we develop a balanced mindset with inflation? Uh, and maybe like, what are some of the pros and cons that you see with inflation? 
Oh, you know, I was, I definitely know the cons and I had to really sit and think about the pros. I was like, <laughs> what would be the positive of stuff getting more expensive? Uh, so, I mean, like you said, like one thing that I you could see as a positive, right, is that the response to high inflation is the raising of interest rates because um, when things, when prices kind of get out of control, the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates. And what it does, it kind of causes like a cooling effect because as the interest rates rise, businesses will stop borrowing so much money. Businesses and people both will stop borrowing so much money. As you borrow less money, you tend to spend less money. And when you spend less, it causes like an overall cooling because you're decreasing demand. Businesses aren't making as much stuff. People aren't buying as much. So it causes prices to either stabilize or tend to fall a little bit because it's the opposite, right? Like when there's not enough of something, everyone wants it, prices go up. When there's too much of something and not enough people want it, they have to lower their prices to get rid of it. So when this type of environment, you may see that, you know, some prices may start to fall. That's the hope. Um, we're kind of seeing it play out a little bit or, and like the, you know, the housing market. It's still right, early. Exactly. But, you know, prices were crazy over the past two years. It's, it's, prices were already crazy and they got really crazy. And so you're seeing now that people are like, hey, look, you know, a, a 2% mortgage <laughs> looked a lot different than like a 6 or 7% mortgage. <laughs> it's a lot more money per month. So people are like, you know what? I think I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to buy a house right now. And so all those people who were like, oh, I can't wait to sell my house and get this, you know, high price, they're finding that it's not there. They're having to like lower the prices. And so you're seeing that either, you know, the amount of houses that are selling are starting to fall. Some markets, the prices are actually coming down. So that could be one positive effect of a high inflation environment is that it can cause some markets that were maybe too hot and like they were prices were going out of control to kind of come back down and be a little more realistic. Now, Prices are going to have to fall a lot more to offset the higher interest rate for it to be affordable for people. So we'll see how big of a benefit that is. But that's one thing. Um, and like you said, as interest rates fall, as well, or as interest rates rise, uh, it's good for your savings account. So if you're someone who was, you know, has an emergency fund out there and you were getting like, you know, 0.2% for the longest time <laughs> or 0.001% of some of these banks, you can now look at these bank accounts and they're paying, you know, three, you know, getting closer to 4% eventually. Uh, so that is going to be a good thing to where now at least you have a better return. I mean, it's still not outpacing inflation, but it is better than it, it was before. Uh, so I would say, you know, on the pro side, that's some of the positives you can take from this because, you know, there's a lot of economists who believe that inflation is a good thing for the economy. I mean, not everyone believes that, but, you know, it's a feeling of like uh, this idea that rising prices kind of incentivize cons consistent growth. And, you know, if you borrowed money when, you know, uh, prices were one amount and, you know, 10 years later, that same dollar amount is, you know, it means less. It's like if it borrowed 10,000 10 years ago, that was a lot more money than $10,000 right now. So there's all these thoughts that uh, inflation, the constant growth in prices is a good thing overall. But there's also a lot of people say it's an unequal thing. You know, it, it affects <laughs> those at the bottom way more than those the people at the top. Right. So, but those are some of the pros I could think of when I really sat and thought about, you know, how inflation could be a positive thing. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E A R N I N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T A L K A N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T O S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust member FDIC.
Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash CD specials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. I like that I stretched you a little bit there. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. Uh, And, you know, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, and I I was kind of surprised and yet, I guess, not surprised. I'm not not quite sure how to think about it, but we've seen data now. uh, We're just past Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and we had record sales. And a lot of the experts, we even had a couple of experts on the show, and they were talking about how retailers were prepared that... Uh, sales would be down because of inflation, that people just weren't going to go out and and buy, you know, as much this year. But obviously, that is not what's happening. And, you know, I'm wondering if, like, do you think people are getting sucked into the the sales and deals? Or are people just not caring? And they, they just want to spend money, and they're just going to, you know, figure out how to pay for it later. I mean, I, I think it's it's so interesting, because all we hear is inflation and how that's impacting you. But then when we look at like this, this data of what happened over Black Friday and Cyber Monday, it appears that most of us just don't really care. <laughs> well, you know, the one thing is we're going to shop, right? Like we're going to still spend money. It's going to take a <laughs> lot to stop us from going to the stores. It's, you know, a little inflation is not enough to keep people from going to buy things. Uh, but what I was, when I was kind of reading up on some of this and kind of seeing some of the updates, because it's still kind of early, they're still getting in some of the data for the past weekend. And then also Cyber Monday, that data hasn't come in, in fully yet. Uh, one thing that they were saying was that prior to the pandemic, Black Friday was kind of losing its, you know, shine. It wasn't as yes, big of a deal right, as it had right. been before. 
And people were starting to kind of spread their spending out over the entire holiday season. So it used to be Black Friday. Everyone was getting up four in the morning. I used to work in retail and I hated it. I'd have to get up early to go open the store and just be miserable because I wanted to be asleep. (laughs) (laughs) But it was a big deal. There was lines outside of stores. And you're seeing, uh, you saw, like, you know, 2019, it was starting to... shift to where people were like, yeah, you know, I can get this. This We realized, oh, this deal isn't that special. They're probably going to keep offering this deal for like a month long type of thing. So people were just spreading their money out over the entire month, essentially a month and a half. Whereas what they saw was that this year, people were kind of going back to that old habit of, oh, let me hop in here and get these Black Friday deals. And it could be because of inflation. People are seeing prices are so high that they're like, hey, let me try to get the best possible deal. Uh, and that's combined with the fact that a lot of these companies are sitting on a lot of inventory because they they ordered a bunch of stuff because obviously, you know, they couldn't get a lot of their inventory in for months and months because of how backed up the harbors were and production lines. And so now they have all this inventory, but they're like, we got to get rid of this because they want the cash back, right? They spent all this money to buy this stuff and they have to sell it to get their money. So a lot of them are putting out slightly better deals than you might see in a hope of getting rid of some of this stuff. So I think it's a it's a combination of people being like, hey. Prices are high. Let me try to get as much of a discount as I can and try to hop on these Black Friday deals. Plus companies being like, yeah, we, we got to get rid of some of this stuff because we have too many things. And I think that might have <laughs> pushed a lot of people back towards uh, making Black Friday a bigger like shopping day compared to you know what it had been a few years ago. Well, I don't know if you did any Black Friday shopping, but I did. I will <laughs> I will certainly raise my hand. And I, I did an experiment this year where I had um, a couple windows open of stuff that I that I was gonna buy. And I saw I had the windows open from, I believe, like Tuesday before Black Friday. And I was just kind of tracking like how the sales would increase. And then just to see, like, does it does it really change? And then, I mean, this year, a couple of the places on Black Friday, they did do a much bigger deal than they did like the day before the day after. So, you know, I think what you're saying is really interesting. Like, you know, maybe the realtors were like, okay, let's just like pour everything on so that people are uh, so jazzed on Black Friday that they just kind of spend with like you know reckless caution. Yeah, exactly. It's like they they did it. They were really trying to bait people to get in because they really wanted them to come in. And and I I did a little bit. I, you know, always online because you know my my the of trauma course. from working in retail yes. on Black Friday means I can never step foot into a store on Black <laughs> we Friday. We all have we all have trauma. <laughs> we can't step foot in stores. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's like yeah, you definitely are seeing that they're trying to get people to come in. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if. Yes, we had higher sales during Black Friday, but will that really pan out when you zoom out and look at the entire holiday season and also take into account inflation, right? Because obviously things are more expensive, so it's going to make the number higher. Like even if people bought fewer things, they cost more. So you could still end right. up with a higher overall total spent without really the demand being exactly the same. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out overall. Yeah, it's sneaky, isn't it? How that works. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, you are the brilliant host over at Popcorn Finance. I just, I, I love the theory behind your show of of talking about money topics and the time it takes you to pop a bag of popcorn, which is just brilliant. And uh, it's always fun to talk to an, another money expert and really geek out about these topics. I'm wondering if you have seen inflation impact your your community of listeners and you know, are there any questions that are kind of popping up around inflation that that people are asking you? You know, I think the the biggest thing, the biggest impact, I know for me personally and for people who uh, listen to the show, it's it's food. I think we've all seen the price at the grocery store like go up to where, you know, you spend a hundred, two hundred dollars and you you're looking at what you got and you're just like, where's the rest of this food? Like this doesn't this doesn't feel like this should have cost this much money. I'm not someone's cheating me somewhere. Right. And somebody took somebody had to take like a bag home or something, right? <laughs> yeah, that I must have missed something. I left something at the store. Let me go back and check. But so uh, yeah, that that is for sure like the biggest area because we all need to eat, obviously. We're, so we're constantly in the habit of going and buying food. So it's right there in your face. And I think that's the biggest thing. And I'm seeing a lot more people turn to cooking at home because eating out is it's as much as eating at gross or getting food from grocery stores is expensive. Like eating out is crazy. Like you're, you're not getting out of there without spending 40, $50 easily. If it's a couple of two people. So uh, you're seeing people definitely shift to trying to cook more at home. Uh, and you know, people are really like looking for ways to like find deals. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see like a resurgence in like uh, like coupon clipping and things like that, that maybe, you know, we're big for a while and it kind of faded away. 
Uh, but I think that's like the biggest thing I'm seeing. That I mean, and also obviously housing with rental prices like like skyrocketing. Like the price of rent has gone up so much in different neighborhoods. Uh, but I think with the housing market, you're starting this housing market kind of cooling. You're starting to see the rental market cool a little bit as well. Uh, especially depends on where you live. You know, obviously some places that are super popular, the demand's going to stay kind of high, but um, housing for sure is taking up a huge portion of people's incomes. And so I think f- between food and housing, you're seeing a lot of people spend the vast majority of their income in those two areas. And that has a significant impact because, you know, that that takes up all your all the rest of your discretionary income. So, you know, if you don't have the same amount of money to, to save, to put into retirement, to go do the things you enjoy to do. So you definitely see the weight of those things kind of pressing on people right now. It's funny you bring up the cost of food because when I was a practicing financial planner and I would work with people, I mean, I could give so many stories, but I I always loved when I would have somebody show me their budget they're currently using. And then I would say, okay, give me your bank statements. Let me, you know, let me compare and contrast and see what's like actually happening with your money and why you're not able to achieve certain goals. And there was always a very clear disconnect between... (laughs) what we thought we were spending on eating out specifically, not groceries, yes. the actual eating out versus what we thought versus what we were actually spending. And I mean, I would watch people's mouths just like drop open. Like there's no possible way I spent that much money eating out. <laughs> and I'm like, well, somehow you did, you know? So I think it's it's really interesting specifically around eating out how even with the high costs of inflation and everything costing more, we still can kind of convince ourselves that we're, you know, spending a certain amount of money eating out to kind of justify, like, you know, you know, how much we're, how much we're spending, how much we think we're spending, I should say, on eating out versus the reality of what's, what's really happening. So I always tell people, I'm like, if you're, if you're struggling and you're like trying to figure out how you can achieve a money goal, like just go straight to your eating out <laughs> oh, yeah. and look what's happening there. And you will be just astonished. Oh, I've been shocked many times when I looked at how much I spent on food. Like, like I, I, I'm fine with being transparent with how much I spend on food. Like, I, my budget is like, I think it's like, was it like six or seven hundred dollars a month for like groceries and eating out? Uh, which is, I'm just lying to myself because that's never, <laughs> it never happens. And I remember one month I looked and it was like twelve hundred dollars, and I was like, Are you kidding me? Twelve hundred dollars. I was like, you know what I could have done with twelve? I could have gone on a vacation. Uh, I could have done a lot of things with that. But it's like it's kind of like what, like a death by a thousand cuts, right? You're spending small amounts of money, you know, twenty, thirty, forty dollars at a time. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you add it all up, if you've been doing that for thirty days, it ends up being a lot more than we think. And you know, we we we're all horrible at like record keeping. Like none of us, we all think we, oh yeah, I'm keeping track. I, I know how much, I'm right? Spending, but yeah, it's always no. way off, like not even close. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, I love that you're so transparent too, because this is something that literally we all we all suffer from. And I, I mentioned I was I was just on your podcast recently. We had such a fun conversation. You cover so many topics on your show, like what we're talking about right now. You talk about fire investing and side hustles and tiny living, which I love. <laughs> Tell us a little bit, Chris, about you know what has your own a money journey been like that kind of led you to popcorn finance. Yeah, you know, I never thought I'd be doing a podcast. Like, I'm a super introvert. Um, I really hated speaking in front of people when I was younger. Like, that, I, I, I'm shocked. I would never have dreamed I'd be doing something like this. But I remember I went to school as an art major uh, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I loved, you know, Pixar. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work at Pixar. Uh, but I got into college and I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm not as passionate as some of these other people. Plus, I didn't realize I had to take all these other art classes that I didn't want to take. Uh, so <laughs> just by chance, I, I took a finance class because it like fit in my schedule. And I was like, this is really interesting. Like, I don't know any of this information. Like, I didn't learn any of this growing up. Uh, my family is like, we, you know, we didn't have like deep money conversations for sure. Didn't learn it in school. And I was at a point where I was like, well, I don't know what I want to do. This is really interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll switch over. And it was just 
pure chance that I was at a school that had a, like an amazing business program and they had a, um, a, a like a concentration or an emphasis in financial planning. So that's kind of, that was like my introduction. So that's why I got my degree in and it, it, it really kind of got me really interested in all of this. But at the same time, you know, I knew all of this stuff and I still got myself into bad financial situations. <laughs> I, I ended up um, when me and my wife got married, we obviously didn't have, we didn't have any money. I graduated in the middle of the recession. So there wasn't like, you know, my job prospects were horrible. Uh, but I ended up, we spent like, you know, $14,000 on a wedding. And then we moved in together and we didn't have furniture. So we bought all this furniture and then she had school expenses. And then we had uh, medical bills that came up and we weren't really good at talking about money. So we ended up just both using credit cards and not paying it off. And long story short, we ended up with like $27,000 in credit card debt. And that was like my first experience really dealing with debt. I hadn't really had any prior to that. And it was just such, uh, just like such a burden. Like I thought about it all the time. I mean, I had twenty seven thousand dollars in credit card debt, and we were probably taking home like forty five thousand dollars combined. Um, so it was it was a lot of money compared to our income. And I think that really solidified in me that I needed to to do better. But also, it gave me a lot of empathy. Like I think sometimes it's easy to get disconnected from people's like journeys and people's struggles, especially if you're like, if you're in a good place, you know, it's kind of hard to, I guess, empathize or see where people are and how you can fall into these situations, even if you, you know better. Um, and so I think going through that as much as I hated it and as, as stressful as it was and how, you know, just, it just, it consumed me every single day. It, it gave me a lot of perspective. And it also is something I always try to hold on to and remember as I continue to, you know, make this content and just, you know, think, you know, this is difficult for a lot of people. And I was fortunate to kind of catch it and, and make some changes and, and get myself in a better situation financially. But a lot of people who that that's that's still a very difficult struggle that they're going through. And it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Uh, so for me, going through that, um, realizing, OK, I need to make these changes. And then because my career went a different direction, I ended up going to like bookkeeping and accounting work um, and analysis. I was like, I really want to still talk about this personal finance stuff. I see how much of a struggle it is for me. I know a lot of people don't know this stuff. And that was kind of the inspiration behind starting the podcast. I was like, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not in the career that I originally set out to be in, but I still really love this stuff. And I, I think it's really useful information for all of us to know. And uh, one day I decided to just go for it. And, uh, you know, five <laughs> years later, it's still going, thankfully. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's what I do now. I love that. You just plug in the mic, start talking and uh you know, you're you're amazing. You got a great voice. You got a, a, amazing content, uh topics that you talk about in such a original format and and people I can totally tell why people just kind of gravitate towards you. And I love that you shared that money hasn't always been easy. I I share that a lot about my own story even as a certified financial planner. I've made a million money mistakes and I think that's what's so tough about money is you know, we can we can study the theory behind money and we can study uh, different things that you should do at different stages in your life. But the reality is life happens. And yeah. sometimes you you get into debt. And then a lot of times you get into debt, you get out of debt and you get back into debt. And yeah. none of these things make you a bad person or a failure or any of that. They just make you a real person who's out there trying to figure this out, just like all the rest of us. Exactly. We're all faced with the same temptations. We all, you know, know we should do better, but it's not as easy as just knowing it, right? It's, it's money is so emotional. It's not just a, a math equation. There's so much that goes into it. Like your past with money, like have you, where you, did you grow up without money? Did you grow up uh, not valuing money? Did you grow up in like with, um, with like difficult family situations where you had to help other people out financially? Are you in a relationship where you're, you know, not able to have autonomy and make decisions on your own? There's so many things that play into how we all handle money and takes it from being a simple, oh yeah, just do this, do that, to being a no, this is hard. And a lot of times we make illogical decisions because of all the stuff we've each experienced. Yeah, for sure. Well, we've been talking about this heavy weighty topic, inflation, <laughs> and we've been talking a lot about how you know money is cyclical. It used to be about like every 10 years, everything would cycle between bull and bear markets with investing in the housing market, unemployment, even recessions. But I feel like over the last 10 years, maybe 20 years, we haven't really followed the cycle. So there's a little bit of unpredictability. Do we, are we in a recession? Are we not in inflation in a recession? You know, what's going to happen in 2023? So 
as we wrap up, Chris, you know, what do you think we need to be prepared for in, in 2023 in terms of inflation? And, you know, how do we how do we prepare our money for, for what might happen next year? Mm. You know, I've, I really wish I could predict the future. I wish I knew exactly what was coming. <laughs> yeah, I could be like, okay, just do this. It's all you got to do. It's going to be great. But yeah, I see a lot of people try to predict the future and they're almost always wrong. Uh, but what we can do is like focus on what we know is coming, right? So we know that for sure interest rates are going to keep rising. So the Federal Reserve, they come out, they do their press conference and uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, he, he already said, look, interest rates are going to keep going up. So, you know, we, they've been saying that all year long, but then people are act shocked when it comes to, you know, we see these news stories. Oh, no, inflation or interest rates are rising. Like we all knew they said they're going to raise it. And they, they keep <laughs> saying they're going to keep raising them. So no one should be surprised when interest rates keep going up. They're meeting again uh, in December. They're meeting in December. They're meeting again, I believe, in February. Um, and so they're expecting to raise rates somewhere of like around 5%. And it, they could change. Like they, they can have a target and they can say, well, that's not good enough. We could change it to something else. But we know for sure interest rates are probably going to raise, you know, another 1%, roughly, maybe a little bit more. Um, so higher interest rates, that means a few things for us, right? So it means that debt is going to be more expensive. Credit card interest rates are variable, meaning that they can just change at any time. Once, uh, typically, they, they do something like some type of formula where it's like um, a, a set rate plus another rate on top of that. And that other rate is one that changes. And so as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, kind of indirectly raises a bunch of other interest rates. So you're going to see credit card rates continue to climb. I know they're already north of 20% now. So, I mean, seeing a 30% rate, if you have a lower uh, credit score, is probably not out of the uh, realm of possibility coming in 2023. So I think it's so important if you have credit card debt specifically because it's such a high interest uh, type of debt to focus on paying that off as much as you can. Like I know most people, you know, you probably can't just write a check and pay it all off. But if you have extra money, try to put it there like that. That probably is going to be the most impactful for you going forward is paying off that credit card debt. Um, another thing though, is that, you know, we're probably gonna see pressure on the housing market. We, we talked about how, you know, housing markets kind of starting to slow and cool down a little bit as interest rates continue to rise, there probably be more pressure on the housing market. So, you know, if maybe you're looking at a house right now, I don't know, maybe you want to wait and see what's going to happen. I mean, you, you buy a house when you're ready. Don't try to time it. Cause you know, we're all going to be wrong trying to guess when houses <laughs> will be at the cheapest point. Uh, but that could be something to look out for. Uh, and then overall, just the economy is going to continue to slow. Um, I, I talked a little bit about how the business cycle works. And as interest rates rise, you start to see the economy cool down. Uh, we've seen layoffs in primarily concentrated in like the tech sector right now. So we've all seen the headlines of like Facebook and Twitter and all these companies doing these layoffs. Um, part of that is because, you know, maybe they overhired. Part of it is, you know, they thought things are going to keep going as great as they were for them and they're not. Um, but we don't know if that's going to bleed into the rest of the job market. Uh, so that's kind of like a wait and see type of thing. If things continue to slow and other companies start to feel like feel the pressure of that and they're seeing their sales fall, you might start seeing some layoffs there. So um, I think the best thing you can do, I think the, like I say, there's probably like four things you can do to really be prepared for the possibility of what 2023 could be. So, you know, number one was pay down any high interest debt, um, build up an emergency fund, if you don't have one, just because, you know, we, we saw during the pandemic when people had to go out on unemployment, if the system gets really hectic and bogged down with a lot of applications, it can take a really long time to get those unemployment payments. So, you know, an emergency fund can help carry you through those periods of time where you don't have enough money to get by. Uh, you don't want to you want to do your best to keep yourself out of a really tough situation and, and keep the keep your household running at, at and covering the bare minimum if you can. Um, another thing I've been hearing a lot about is like networking, like just kind of being out there, making yourself visible, letting people know what you're working on, getting on LinkedIn, just building like a personal brand. Uh, I talked to uh, Mandy from the Brown Ambition podcast, and she talked all about like building a, a personal brand and really letting people know who you are and what you do and, and you know, being active and visible because it's already hard enough finding a job. But if you can be on people's minds already, it just makes it that much easier. Uh, to, to find a new uh, a new job. And then lastly, you know, just keep investing, even though it's scary. And I think when people see the stock market not doing well, 
It's like, well, it's not doing well. I'm not putting my money in there. Uh, but when it's doing poorly, that's probably where you're going to be able to see the best returns because you're, you know, it's the whole thing. You don't want to buy when things are super high. Like when, when the prices are at their all time high, it's probably the, you know, it's, I won't say it's the worst time to buy, but you're going to get the less, the <laughs> least amount of return, obviously, because if they're at their high, you know, if they go up again, it's probably going to be less than if you bought when everything is down like it is now. And when the market recovers, you get to benefit from that. So don't let the fear of what's going on right now make you feel like, oh, I shouldn't invest because, you know, the stock market is doing poorly. It's probably a great time to hop in and, and do it. Just be consistent and don't, you know, don't let your emotions determine when you decide to, to invest and save for your future. But I think those four things are the best thing you can do. Obviously, it's not going to protect all of us in every situation, uh, but it at least gives you a nice, strong foundation to, to work off of and, and hopefully help you ride out whatever's coming in uh, 2023. I was recently hanging ornaments on my Christmas tree and I pulled out the one we got in 2020. I don't know if you have this ornament, but it is a it is a butte. And, and that is simply a toilet paper roll. I'm not sure there was ever a better real life show of inflation that we all live through than the search for toilet paper at whatever it cost in 2020. As Chris said, inflation, the big old beast of an elephant in here is here to stay for a while. That's cool. While you may not like it, you can be smart and set your money up to shield against inflation and even work with inflation. If you want to learn more about Chris, you can check out his podcast, Popcorn Finance, on any podcast player, or you can find him on Instagram at Popcorn Finance Podcast or Popcorn Finance on TikTok. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with a friend or family member who might also want to take a deep dive into inflation. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest as well as the amazing sponsors that make this show possible. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Most of us have clothes that we've loved for years, maybe even decades, but it's harder than ever to find clothes that will stand the test of time. If you're looking for more pieces designed to last, you can't go wrong with American Giant. From hoodies and t-shirts to denim and more, They've got everything you need to build a wardrobe that you'll be proud of for years to come. All American Giant clothing is created with a commitment to doing things better. From the materials they use down to the last stitch in every piece. And everything is made right here in America, in partnership with people and communities. Because keeping things local ensures the kind of quality you'll appreciate as soon as you receive your order. Discover the American Giant difference today. Shop wardrobe essentials that last a lifetime at American-Giant.com and get 20% off your first order when you use code LT23 at checkout. That's 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com. Promo code LT23. This year, Kind Snacks is inviting you to leave behind the diet and wellness fads that are no longer serving you. Instead, grab a Kind Bar, a nutritious and delicious way to eat more of the real, whole, recommended foods that we're not eating enough of, like nuts and whole grains. Because all Kind Nut Bars lead with the first ingredient, nutrient-dense whole nuts, and they're gluten-free. With great flavors everyone will love, including caramel almond and sea salt and peanut butter dark chocolate. So shut out the noise, trust your taste buds, and shop Kind Bars at Amazon today.